Since the beginning of cinema, music has been a pivotal part of the production. From the first silent films to the first talkies to contemporary cinema, audio's relation to the visual has been integral to a movie's performance. During the silent era of cinema starting in the 1890s, a film's music was provided independently by each theatre. As the films came with no audio, the music was either played using a phonograph or performed live by an in-house musician improvising along to the film, or a band playing a classical piece. In 1929, it became possible to synchronize music and sound to celluloid, quickly becoming an integral aspect of the storytelling process. Studios raced to composers to commission new material for their films. Fast forward to 1967 and Mike Nichols' The Graduate, starring Dustin Hoffman. The film's soundtrack was composed almost entirely of licensed songs from Simon and Garfunkel, including an original song from the duo Mrs. Robinson. The song became a number one hit, increasing the popularity of the film, and so began Hollywood's strategy of acquiring popular music to score their films, as well as bringing potential for additional income through record sales. Songs were now being used not only to affect the emotion of the scene, or just for music's sake, but to utilize the popularity of the song and the frequency of which an audience member will hear said song to ingrain the memory of the movie within the viewer's brain. In the new Hollywood era of the 1970s, film music began heading down the direction of more contemporary instruments with the introduction of computerized melodies, with John Carpenter and his synthesizer at the forefront. However, John Williams was doing his best work on little-known films like Jaws and Star Wars, keeping the classic score style of Hollywood's golden age alive. Take this scene for instance. In this scene in 1977 Star Wars A New Hope, Williams uses score to inform character and story much like he does throughout the film. The score creates a sense of hope and desire, highlighting Luke's longing for a life away from Tatooine. There's no dialogue, yet the viewer understands how Luke feels, and it foreshadows the adventure that is to come. Elsewhere in the galaxy, the villainous empire is scored by this piece. The homophonic brass and drums create an atmosphere of authority and intimidation. The strange effect of this piece is reminiscent of real-world military anthems, used to both enthuse the troops and scare the enemy. The theme is also used for Darth Vader, representing how Anakin Skywalker has been stripped of his humanity and is truly one with the Empire now. Williams' iconic use of the score to represent certain characters or the theme of the film can be found in all his work, including... and... Jump forward in time today and once again there's very little occurrence of iconic themes, unless of course they are apparent throughout a series such as Pirates of the Caribbean or Mission Impossible. More and more we are seeing studios resort to the methodology of The Graduate and incorporating soundtrack instead of originally composed scores. Perhaps the days of classic scores and forming characters such as Williams did with Star Wars will just disappear. Today I want to discuss the concept that soundtrack is character. And who better to look at than the paragon of modern geek culture, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In 2008, Marvel Studios and Paramount Pictures produced Iron Man, the first film in the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and this song, ACDC's Back in Black, was the first piece of music audiences heard. Along with composers Ram and Jawadi's original score, John Favreau decided to make Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark a heavy metal fan, and throughout the film used heavy metal music. The heavy metal helps inform Tony's character with the origin of the music genre and its associated reputation of rebelling against society and contemporary music norms reflecting Tony's rebellious nature, as well as underscoring the high energy and excitement of the film. It's also a pun. I'm, I'm surprised there was no Iron Maiden or Steel Panther or Steely Dan. The popularity that the soundtrack gained made way for Marvel and ACDC to sign a deal to produce a compilation album for Iron Man 2, which made its way to number one album in the UK charts, which really highlights its popularity. After Disney acquired Marvel Entertainment and began solely producing the films, a sudden lack of soundtrack was apparent, save for this instant in 2012's Avengers. Agent Romanoff, you miss me? As soon as ACDC's Shoot to Thrill begins, you instantly know it's Iron Man, after two films of associating that music with the character. Not content with only Black Sabbath's Iron Man as his theme song, Marvel made an entire genre of music signify Tony Stark's presence. A character with one song that relates to him and is present almost throughout his entire character arc is Captain America. In 2014's Captain America The Winter Soldier, we hear this song in Steve Rogers' apartment.
don't remember giving you a key. You really think I'd need one? The song Fury is playing is It's Been a Long Time by Harry James and Kitty Callan. The song is from the perspective of someone welcoming their loved one home at the end of the war. It acts as an example of dramatic irony, representing Steve Rogers' tragic relationship with Peggy Carter, whom he never got to return to after the war and spend his life with, as a result of being frozen for almost a hundred years. Relatable, am I right? It's been a long, long time acts as a reminder that although Steve is a hero of our time, he is a man displaced from his own and constantly feels like an outsider. His dedication to the Avengers being a result of his giving up on the idea of settling down with his true love. But where the MCU's utilisation of the soundtrack shines most bright is here. All of a sudden, soundtrack was back and a whole galaxy was dancing. Much like how the city of New York in rom-coms acts as a third character, the soundtrack curated by writer and director James Gunn is both a character and a MacGuffin. 2014's Guardians of the Galaxy and its 2017 sequel incorporate a soundtrack that not only was one of the first films of which diegetic music, music played within the scene, directly influenced the on-screen action, paving the way for films like Edgar Wright's Baby Driver, but it was also integral to the story as well. As well as leading to a film accompanied by the music from the 60s, 70s and 80s, the best era of music, Peter Quill's Awesome Mix Volume 1 serves as his last connection to his dead mother Meredith. Marvel Studios afforded James Gunn complete creative control over the soundtrack, allowing him to write specific song choices into the script to accompany the scene, leading to moments such as the hero's escape from the space prison accompanied by Escape, the Pina Colada song, or fooled around and fell in love, accompanying intimate moments between Quill and Gamora. Peter Quill's acceptance of his mother's death is signified by him finally opening the last present she gave him and the revelation of the awesome mix Volume 2. The sequel, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, furthers this idea by incorporating the meaning of a song into the film's narrative with characters directly acknowledging songs, such as Kurt Russell's ego discussing Looking Glass's Brandy You're a Fine Girl. See. The sea calls the sailor back. He loves the girl, but that's not his place. Sea calls upon him as history calls upon great men. And sometimes we are deprived of the pleasures of mortals. Absolute perfection. Now, let's look at where this fails. 2016's Suicide Squad was a film plagued by a myriad of production issues, mainly due from studio interference and a lack of competent leadership. Upon the success of films like Guardians of the Galaxy, Warner Brothers panicked and decided that audiences no longer wanted dark and gritty films like Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, or like the film they were currently producing. David Ayer had written the script for Suicide Squad in six weeks and had filmed around 230 hours of footage and principal photography, with the film having the dark and gritty tone that Warner Brothers had hired Ayer for. With the studio's new vision of cheerful, lovable rebels, much like its Marvel counterpart, they hired a trailer editing company named Trailer Park, who had produced a trailer for Suicide Squad which featured Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen, giving it an entirely new tone from the first trailer, to recut the film and give it their desired tone. This meant that, unlike how James Gunn selected each song in the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack based on how the music and the story behind it fit in with the film's narrative, the soundtrack of the Suicide Squad has no real connection to what's on screen. What was written and shot by David Ayer and what was produced from the edit by Trailer Park are two different films. What came out in cinemas was... Really, really bad. Marvel excels at using soundtrack as character. Whether it's to inform story or character, the Marvel Cinematic Universe achieves emotional comprehension through the use of well-thought-out curated soundtracks that establish a connection between our love of the music to individual aspects of a narrative. So we gain a sense of satisfaction when a character's story comes to a satisfying ending, and this song has been present throughout his story, or an emotional response after a character we love has died and his legacy lives take on. Take care of the suit. I'll take care of the music. 